Hey everyone, let's talk about pollution control. There's really going to be three major mechanisms for putting into place pollution control. And the first and most effective one, but probably the most difficult one to enact, is prevention. If we burned less fossil fuel, particularly coal and oil, that would reduce um, a lot of pollution, including sulfur pollution and nitrogen oxide emissions and particulate matter. Um, so it, it would have a big effect. Or um, also by burning better quality coal, um, can also be really helpful. There are coals and oils that have lower amounts of sulfur in them, which is important, but of course the less sulfur they have, the more expensive those products will be on the market. Um, technology, of course, is going to be a significant way that we can control pollution, and we're going to talk about a number of different devices that can remove pollutants from uh, predominantly the emissions of combusted fossil fuels, and then also innovations in how we live. Changing what we think or how we act um, could make a big difference in terms of controlling pollution. So um, kind of digging into those a little more specifically, um, removing sulfur dioxide from coal is going, to, as I mentioned, is a, is a great way to reduce contaminants and pollutants in um, the product that's left over when you, those are, that's a terrible wording. <laughs> Removing sulfur dioxide from coal will reduce the contamination in the emissions from that burning or combustion of the coal. And one way that we can do that is by fluidized bed combustion, which is a very fancy word or expression, which really just means we're going to allow the coal burning process to take place in close proximity to calcium carbonate. Um, because when you heat calcium carbonate, it very effectively will take in sulfur dioxide. And it actually produces, um, the, the reaction produces calcium sulfate. And it turns out that calcium sulfate um, is something that we use to manufacture gypsum, um, and gypsum or gypsum, gypsum is what makes wallboard or sheetrock that we use to build homes. So um, it's kind of a twofer in that sense. You can also um, clean coal of some other contaminants prior to combustion as well, but again, those processes are expensive. Um, catalytic converters on cars. We have so many cars on the road at this point that controlling the emissions um, from those vehicles is a significant way of impacting poll air pollution. Um, catalytic converters are made up of rare earth metals, including platinum and palladium. Um, and essentially what they do is they grab um, nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxides um, after gasoline has been combusted. Um, and that prevents them from being released into the air. But interesting turn of events on that, um, catalytic converters were required starting in 1975, but that was back when gasoline had lead in it as an additive, um, but which of course was bad. It was putting lead into the air, and lead exposure is really bad for children and adults, as we've learned, um, or I don't even know that we have learned it. That's probably in an upcoming chapter. Um, so lead is really bad, and we hadn't actually um, regulated lead, but because catalytic converters were being required and they can't be exposed to lead, that's what made us ban lead in gasoline, which in turn significantly reduced the amount of lead in the air in the United States, and that turned out to be really good for people. Um, we're going to talk about scrubbers on smokestacks um, as a way to remove some contaminants in particulate matter. We're going to talk about bag house filters, electrostatic uh, precipitators, and uh, let's just dig right into those. So the first one we have here is the bag house filter. This is essentially an old-fashioned Hoover vacuum cleaner, right? So 
Really, we just have these special fabric bags. Um, we're gonna pump air, that whatever it is, the emission that we're trying to clean, we're gonna pump it through the bag, and only the clean air will be able to exit through um, the pores in the bag, and all of the par particles um, will be trapped inside the bag. Now, that does mean, uh, th by the way, these can be highly effective at removing particulate matter, but you have to clean the bag filters or replace them. They don't last forever and it slows the flow of the air or the emissions that you're trying to clean, which often means you need a pump to create pressure to force the, the air or emissions through the bag house filters. And so there is energy in the form of electricity required for this process, which in turn generates more CO2 air pollution. So while we're you know cleaning the air of particulate matter, which is good, uh, but then the downside is we may be generating more carbon dioxide. And that's gonna be true for most of uh, all, all of these devices that we're gonna talk about. Um, then we have the electrostatic precipitator. Um, this is just where we use electricity to, to create positive and negative charges on devices that will then attract particles in the exhaust stream or the emissions that are being generated and they will attach to their oppositely you know charged item and so that's how they get removed and again all you have to do is then just clean the the plates so the uh particles typically um are going to pass through a negatively charged plate making them all negative and then within the electrostatic precipitator, you have these positive collection plates, so everything that's negatively charged will stick to them, and then you just need to clean off the positive plates periodically um, by just discharging the positive feed to it, and it will fall down into like a, a hopper or a, a container at the bottom. So these are, these are great, they work pretty well, but again, they need electricity, so you're generating um, electricity to to source these and then that in turn is going to produce carbon dioxide emissions. And then the last one we have here is the scrubber. Um, in this one we are going to literally take the particles and using um, water droplets um, we're going to kind of create like a, a sludgy uh, stuff that we can collect at the bottom. So we're going to take advantage of gravity here. So you can see we've got this piping network. It's going to create a really fine mist. Um, the dirty air is pumped into the bottom. It's going to rise up in order to exit out um, into the smokestack. It's going to have to pass through all of these misters. And when it does that, um, the mist uh, will collect the particles and that causes them to fall down into the bottom um, and then we can just remove that dirty water and the good news is the water can actually be recycled and just the sludge has to go to a landfill but again that means we're using electricity in this process um, generating co2 and we're going to have sludge and we're going to have sl uh, um, waste from the other two as well that will have to be stored someplace um, and potentially could be designated as a hazardous material for storage depending on what kinds of contaminants are being cleaned out of that um, exhaust stream. Um, your book also goes on to talk about a couple of things that I just want to make sure that you're aware of. One, they talk about some Clean Air Amendments, um, Clean Air Act Amendments, including the selling um, and buying of allowances for uh, certain um, quantities of sulfur. So at some point, I think we've talked about cap and trade, and this allowances for sulfur is very similar. Businesses are allotted a certain number of allowances for a particular quantity of sulfur. If they're going to release more than that, they either have to buy an allowance from somebody that isn't going to use up all of their allowances, or they're going to have to pay a penalty. Um, so the idea is it it would incentivize people to reduce their sulfur emissions because if they reduce their sulfur emissions, they definitely would not have a penalty and they might not use up all their allowances, allowing them to sell those allowances and make profit that way. Um, and then the last thing in this section that I'd love for you to just take a peek at is on page 424, there's a little do the math calculating annual sulfur reductions. Um, they give you some data for total sulfur uh, emissions, excuse me, 
sorry, let me try that again. They give you data for total sulfur dioxide emission reductions in the United States, and they want you to calculate the total percentage of reduction and the annual percentage reduction of those sulfur dioxide emissions. Um, and they literally just walk you through it. It's pretty easy. You're just subtracting um, and getting the total reduction, which is 13.2 million metric tons. You're going to divide the reduction by the original amount, which was 23.5, times it by 100 to get the percent. So that would be 56% was the total reduction. And then to calculate the reduction per year, you just need to divide 56 by the number of years from beginning to end. And in this case, it was 26. It was 2008 to, uh, from 1982 to 2008. So 26 years, 56% percent divided by 26 years is going to be 2.2 percent reduction per year. Um, I point out that math problem because given the new format for the AP exam, I think it's almost a guarantee that there will be at least one question that's math heavy. So now's the time to really start, you know, focusing on any math that you see in these chapters or in practice problems or in the review book um, because the more math you can do, the more points you can pick up relative to other students taking the test. Okay, and then uh, the last little bit I want to talk about is stratospheric ozone. 